Jake Boudreau. I'd like to welcome you to the Almadam Experience. This is a four-part series that examines how exactly Almadam went from a thriving place within the fishing industry to a place that's in the wake of a crisis and looking for answers, looking for revitalization. The first part of this series, Fisher Cut Bait, will examine the historical context behind how Almadam lost its fishing industry and how the people responded. What human emotions ran through people's minds as they found out that they had lost their job at home, at the place that we're standing right here right now, the Richmond Fisheries Plant in Petit de Gras. How the Richmond Fisheries Plant went from a thriving industry that employed few hundred people in its peak to what it is today, home to an empty ship. This series will explore the historical context behind this decline in the fishery. We will explore the human emotions. We will explore the community response to the fisheries crisis. And we'll also look into how development on Madame was set up in the wake of this crisis. Isle Madame can be found on the most southeastern tip of Cape Breton Island. Geographically, we stand on our own in the midst of the Strait of Canso, from which we are 30 minutes away. With a size of approximately 70 square miles, we manage a population of about 4,300. This population is scattered amongst a variety of coastal and inland villages, which can most easily be identified by the four major communities of West Arishat, Arishat, Petit de Gras, and Descous. Our culture is a vast blend from the regions around us. The majority are Acadians, of whom a sizable portion are bilingual. In addition, there are numerous families of Irish, Scottish, and English descent. Our landscape is distinctly coastal, providing visitors with panoramic views of the Atlantic Ocean or inland delights to the senses. The climate is influenced by the ocean, which allows us nominally cold winters and summers tempered by cool breezes. Despite our close proximity to the ocean, Isle Madame can boast to contain 12 freshwater lakes fed by a vast network of streams, all teeming with aquatic life of many kinds. Since our founding, Isle Madame has relied heavily upon the sea to support our population, but that has become difficult with changes in technology and the depletion of the ground fish stocks. Today, some islanders rely on jobs in more commercially prosperous regions. Those who remain make a living from industries like aquaculture, professional careers, in the service industry, the resource sector, in small business enterprises, or in information technology. In addition to distinct cultures, landscapes, and economy, Isle Madam also shares a rich history, dating back much further than is commonly known. Also little known is that Aborigines aside, Isle Madam was not solely settled by the French. The first settlers to the area were the uh, fishermen from various European nations who crossed the Atlantic during the, uh, during the summer months and set up fishing stations along the, the coast of Atlantic Canada and then returned to Europe in the winter once they'd finished fishing cod or walrus or whales or whatever it was they were after. And it's, it's likely that some of those fishermen from those European nations uh, set up on Isle Madame. Um, what's now called the Bay of Rocks, uh, Rocky Bay, was originally called La Bay des Espagnols and that indicates that there were Basque fishermen there. In fact, there's uh, records that have been discovered in archives in uh, the Spanish Basque country that indicate that there were probably Basque fishermen in this area as early as the 1580s or 90s. As the French gained control of the Maritimes, many French settlers poured into Cape Breton Island to build up French control of the region. Settlements like St. Peter's and Arishat became significant outposts for French vessels and were important militarily as ports directly on the Bredor Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, along uh, with the Basque, uh, later on came uh, the Acadians, some, and then we had also some uh, French people from uh, 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 associated with uh, Nicolas Denis. 
that did uh, use the island of Il Madame as a, as a port for the fisheries. From there it grew, and uh, Il Madame grew uh, uh, quite a bit around 1720 with the building of Fortress Louisbourg. Uh, the King of France mandated uh, two seigneurs from Quebec, Sieur d'Auteuil and Sieur de Jouvert, to come to Il Madame to set up a seigneury. A seigneurie would be some kind of a feudal land division or uh, what you would call uh, a, um, I would say, a political entity uh, to, uh, uh, to provide for Louisbourg. With the French Empire crumbling, many Acadians from the Annapolis Basin found refuge among the well-hidden coves of Isle Madame. The British took over what is now the Annapolis Valley after 1712, and they threatened to expel the Acadians, and they offered them a choice at that time to leave before the expulsion. So some of those families took up the offer and moved to Port Toulouse, now St. Peter's. Uh, among those families, you'd have the, the Boudreaux's, the, uh, the Coast, the Dugas, the Sampsons, the Martels, all of those families, you would have found them at Port Toulouse. There were a few families that didn't settle at Port Toulouse that settled at the Scous. So you'd have the, the, Log, the Loglois, the Legends. There weren't too many others. There were a handful of families that settled at the Scous, and those, uh, the Joyces were settled at the Scous. At that time, they were called uh, Les Joss, J-O-S-S-E. And uh, in Petit de Gras, now interestingly enough, Petit de Gras was mainly settled by Basque fishermen, fishermen from the uh, from the port of Saint-Jean-de-Luz in, in France, and that's in French Basque country. And most of them were either independent fishermen or were working for the, uh, the two merchants who had set up there, and they were both Basque, Hiriat and Daroupet. As Louisbourg became more developed and the expulsion of the Acadians, we saw more Acadians coming into El Royale, and they were pointed in this direction because Il Madame has a track of land that's comparative to uh, the uh, Annapolis Basin of today. I mean, uh, and it runs uh, diagonally. If you see in the old uh, agricultural maps of Il Madame, you know, there were uh, orchards here, and they did export uh, many different kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, to the European markets as well as Louisbourg. And the fishery was also uh, substantial, uh, you know, in providing the, the, the food necessary for the fortress. By 1713, a permanent settlement was established in Erishad. Our close proximity and common culture with Louisbourg showed its influence as the island was named in honor of Madame de Maintenant, the wife of French King Louis XIV. Through the 1700s, Amadame's population grew steadily, as did the economy, which drew heavily from the sea. By mid-century, French control of the Maritimes had all but disappeared, and the British Crown was rounding up French citizens to be deported. Many, like the citizens of Louisbourg, needed a safe port in the storm. But what the British did after they took Louisbourg is they went through Cape Breton Island and they destroyed all of the French settlements. So they would have wiped out everything that was in Petit de Gras and, and St. Peter's. There were people settled in St. Anne's Bay and up around Manadou and Port Morian, and they would have destroyed all those French settlements. The Basque fishermen who were settled at Petit de Gras, most of them left and went home. The Acadians who were settled at Port Toulouse and at Descous didn't leave. They went into the woods or they went into hiding. And instead of, instead of returning to St. Peter's, some of them went to River Bourgeois, some of them went to Lord Was, some of them, uh, most of them came and ended up settling on Isle Madame. You'd have families like the, uh, the Foraz, the Terriots, the Leblancs. Uh, those families would have been expelled from the Annapolis Valley in 1755. Some of them would have been sent to England, some to France, some to Sapir and Michelin, some to the United States. Some would have been held as prisoners in, in Halifax. And they arrived in, at different times and in different ways, but they all ended up arriving on Isle Madame. Seeking refuge from the Protestant majority in the British Isles, some Irish Catholic families settled on Al Madame, largely in Rocky Bay and Erishad. As the 1700s wore on, you would have had a number of Irish families immigrating, some directly from Ireland, more probably coming um, to Isle Madame from Ireland via Newfoundland. This continued influx of settlers looking for a sustained living on Al Madame 
ballooned the population to 1,500 through the 1700s, a figure now including Basque, Irish, French, and soon to include more English settlers. At the time the second wave of Acadians arrived on Isle Madame, they were accompanied in some cases by uh, merchants from the Channel Islands. Uh, the Channel Islands are located between France and England in the English Channel, hence the name the Channel Islands. They were originally part of France and were taken over uh, by England a long, long time ago, but the people there continued to speak French. However, because they were part of England, they became Protestants. So they were a unique commodity. They were French-speaking Protestants. So that gave them the ability to communicate with the Acadians, who at that time were the only people living in, uh, in Eastern Canada. At the same time, it gave them the ability to deal with the British and the British government because they could speak English, even though it wasn't their first language, and they were Protestant, which at that time was an important factor in business and politics. So a number of these families uh, came and settled on Isle Madame. They were all merchants. They all set up uh, fishing, trading operations. And you see the names are, are still evident in the geography of Isle Madame. Uh, Janvrin's Island, the Janvrin family came. Uh, Robbins, the, the Robin family, uh, set up an outpost in Arishat. Fishing was still uh, very uh, predominant, for, especially amongst the Acadians. And we see many fish plants coming in. Every little community had a fish plant on the island. From the schools, Cape Laround, uh, Petit de Gras had several, Arishat had several, West Arishat, Jarvin's Island, they were all quite into it. And with the arrival of the, of the Jerseymen, these are the people that pretty well had the fish plants because they were, the, the Acadians at that time were not allowed to uh, traffic in commerce. Uh, so these people arrived to do exactly that. In other words, they would uh, exploit the Acadian manpower in order to uh, get the product to put it on market. Like other minority groups, Acadians were subject to harsh prejudice, which challenged our economic prosperity and made Acadian fishermen subservient to English merchants and politicians. When the Acadians arrived here, they were Catholic and French-speaking. As Catholics, they couldn't vote, they couldn't teach school, they couldn't go to school, they couldn't uh, be elected to the, to the Legislative Assembly, they couldn't even own land because there were penal laws which penalized people for being Catholic. So they led a fairly uh, vagrant existence at first. They didn't have access, they didn't even have access to priests initially. They had to, what they did it was, they had to if somebody wanted to get married, the community had to come together and more or less witness the marriage. And then when a priest arrived four or five years later, the people would go and have the marriage consecrated by the priest. But they've been living as husband and wife for four or five years. In response, Acadians did what they were allowed to do. Fish, build boats, and navigate. They learned well and became renowned on the sea. The Acadians initially had been had been farmers. They had, they had never been uh, fishermen or, uh, or they had never gone to sea. But when they arrived on Isle Madame, I mean, farming on Isle Madame is, today it's not a particularly prosperous activity and it wasn't then either. And they quickly realized that if they were going to make a living, it was going to be from the sea. And within the space of a generation or two, they turned themselves from small scale fishermen selling their fish to the Jersey merchants. In many cases, they acquired the skills necessary to build larger and larger vessels, and they built their own vessels. And uh, they acquired the navigational skills to be able to sail those vessels around the world. And the Acadian part of the population concentrated, the Acadians who became successful were almost exclusively sea captains. The fish were, were there were there for the taking literally off the shores of Isle Madame and certainly if you had a vessel that could venture out to the Grand Banks you could you could fill your ship fairly easily. Cod, which would have been the the highest priced uh, fish product that they would have fished in these waters, was in high demand in Europe as a foodstuff. So you could make money catching cod in uh, off the waters off Cape Breton and Newfoundland and selling it in Europe and then in turn you could use the money you had made selling the cod to buy manufactured goods in Europe that weren't being made in North America because it was a, a pioneer settlement at that time. And then taking those goods and selling them to the same fishermen that you had bought your cod from, you know.
So in some cases, in the case of the Robbins family, the fishermen sold all their fish to the Robbins and bought all the goods that they needed from the Robbins. So they, and, most, and so the Robbins had a monopoly and they were able to control the price of fish and the price they were charging for the manufactured goods. So they kept the fishermen constantly in debt to their firm. They took the, uh, the lesser grades of fish, such as mackerel, and they traded them in the Caribbean to the slave owners who fed them to their slaves. And in, while they were in the Caribbean, they picked up products such as rum and molasses. From there, the Acadian uh, ship captains were able to expand, and they started carrying cargoes all over the world. They'd carry cargo from Halifax to New York, a cargo, then pick up a cargo and take it from New York to London, pick up a cargo in London and take it to India. And uh, that's how, based on the, the expertise they learned in the triangular trade route, they were able to extend their, their network of trading and cargo carrying all over the world. Shipbuilding evolved into the cornerstone of the Almadam economy. Fishing alone could not employ or sustain the thousands of Acadians on Almadam. So this industry began to build up the island and its productivity spun off in ports like Erishat, Descous, and West Erishat. In the early 19th century, you would have had up to 60 vessels a year being built uh, just in Erishat. And if you, look around, if you looked around Isle Madame, you would have found practically every other cove that provided a bit of shelter and had a bit of wood that there was a vessel being constructed. In Erishat, there were five forges operating to supply the iron work that was needed on those vessels. The Robbins Company had 30 vessels um, sailing out of Erishat. They mightn't have been registered here, but they, they had their own fleet just sailing out of Erishat. By the time of Confederation, the American Civil War, there would have been three to 400 vessels registered just in Erishat, not counting the number of vessels registered in, in West Erishat and the schools. And uh, the Americans maintained an agent here in Erishat, and so did the Spanish and the French because they had so many of their boats and their nationals coming into port in Erishat that they had to have somebody here to represent their interests. There were 24, and even as late as the 1800s, there were 24 wharves on the southern side of Erishat Harbor. There was a photo shop in Erishat, there was an ice cream parlor, there were two Chinese laundries. There were lawyers, there were doctors, there were, uh, there were motels a couple of motels. As the 1800s progressed, visitors to the island noted the charm and prosperity here. The Bishop of Quebec, upon coming to Almadam in 1815, commented on the great activity in our ports. By 1832, the population soared over to 2,000 mark in Erishat alone. Then in 1844, Erishat was recognized by the Holy See as the seat of the new diocese for all of eastern Nova Scotia. This status would not last through the 1800s, as a variety of unexpected events stemmed the prosperity of Almadam. Historians have identified a number of causes of the decline. Uh, one cause would have been, of course, the, the most obvious thing is that that entire economy was based on sail. You were looking at, at sailing vessels. And those vessels could be constructed fairly easily, practically anywhere on Almadam and in Nova Scotia around the coast with the skills that people had and the materials that were available at hand. When steamships started to take over, of course, the investment in the steamship is much more significant than an investment in a sailing vessel. The technology was greater and the amount of money and capital required to build it is significantly bigger. And Nova Scotians, because they had, the economy was based on sail, did not have the financial wherewithal and didn't have the, the technical knowledge and didn't have the resources to be able to build these, these steam vessels and never got themselves organized enough to be able to build those steam vessels. So as steam took over from sail, and I mean this didn't happen overnight, it was a long slow process that started in the, the 1880s and continued to the 1940s. Also there was a, a great storm I believe in 1872 that wiped out a good part of the uh, of the fleet in Erishat, so that's been blamed for part of the, uh, the decline in prosperity. These events soon brought a flood of unwanted results, as Almadam lost the lucrative trade route between Almadam, Europe, 
the United States, and the Caribbean. The first part of the trade that would have been lost from, uh, to, uh, to steamships would have been the transatlantic trade. And suddenly sailing vessels were no longer competitive in that trade. So they were confined then to doing what was called the coastal trade. They'd, they'd run from Isle Madame to uh, PEI to New Brunswick, uh, around uh, Nova Scotia maybe to the Bay of Fundy. In 1855, St. Francis Xavier University was moved from Arishat to Antigonish. The Confederation Agreement of 1867, with policies of tariffs and free trade, moved economic prosperity to Ontario, Quebec, and New England. Many islanders followed this financial displacement, and the population decreased by 2,000. These calamities left Almadam in poor shape to confront the challenges emerging in a new century and in a new country. Another factor is the, the brain drain. There were tremendous opportunities at the time in, the, in Boston and the New England states. And even though this place was prosperous and you could make a living here, you could make a better living in the New England states. So some of your best and brightest, the good part of the best and brightest, were drained off to, uh, to the Boston states, as they were called. As the naval industry in Nova Scotia declined into the 1920s, an incredible exodus of young Atlantic Canadians poured into the ports of New England. As the Great Depression struck, even the dependable fishing industry began to show signs of mortality. With new technology, and I can remember I'm not that, that old, but when I grew up as a, as a boy in Pere de Gras, my father, who was an inshore fisherman, didn't want us to become part of the fishery because the inshore fishery was no longer viable. The fishing economy of the, even up to the 1940s, was very similar to the fishing economy of the 1760s that I described earlier. The fishermen were fishing in small boats with no cabins. They were fishing relatively close to shore. They had no engines. All they had was uh, sails and oars in terms of uh, power for the vessel. There were, no, there were no licenses or anything that had to be applied for at that time. You went and, and fished what you could fish depending on, on what fish was available at that time of the year. And the fishermen were um, up to the 1940s selling their fish to merchants, to, usually to the same merchants who they were buying their, uh, their manufactured goods from. And most of the time they, they were in debt to those merchants. Parts of Almadan moved on from subsistence fishing and embraced the new technology of their time. They wanted steady employment, better wages, and less labor-intensive work. When the fish plant was built in Petit de Gras, this marked the dawn of an industrial age. The reason that transformation took place from the old economy, the old fishing, traditional fishing economy, to the new fishing economy based on the fish plant is, the, is that there was a, an evolution in the, in the technology. And the major evolution was the ability to freeze the fish and ship it. Before all, the f no, no fish could be, uh, the fish either had to be canned and shipped in cans, or had to be salted and fished or, or dried and, uh, and shipped in that form. But uh, the freezing technology allowed this major evolution. And what happened, the advance in technology from the traditional methods of shipping fish to the freezing allowed the evolution of, of an industrial. Uh, fishing became an industrial activity. Instead of being similar to farming, where the individual went out and harvested a crop, or the fishermen went out and harvested fish, now it was a large company going out with a large trawler dragger harvesting the fish and processing it in a large industrial fish plant. So that, that fish plant was very much an industrial activity. And what it provided, it provided a steady wage that fishermen had never had before. So many of them sold their boats, got out of the industry, and got into, uh, went to work in the fish plant. I mean, at, some, at, at its peak, I suppose, Boots Fisheries was employing 500 people between the people who were fishing on the Boots Fisheries boats and the people who were employed in the plant. And that changed the entire nature of the economy and, and the society in Isle Madame. We became an economy and a society of workers instead of independent people who made their living from the sea and from the land.
fishermen were getting bigger boats so they could go for long lining. To go long lining, they wanted bigger boats to go for her, because that's where the fish was. They couldn't get a decent catch inside. Not only did the fish plant change the manner of work on Almadam, it transformed our economic and social structures, spawning new roads, better phone service, and more people in the service industries and professional services or in small business. The Booth Fisheries Plant was built in the late 1940s and early 1950s and immediately there were changes on Isle Madame. Up to that time the phone system on Isle Madame was owned by the Isle Madame Telephone Company which was owned by a, a local doctor. Uh, the service wasn't very good and very few homes were connected to the phone system and the phone system wasn't good enough to connect Booth's Fisheries with its, uh, with its parent company in Boston, with the main office in the United States. And so the phone company was sold to mt and and the system improved to suit Booth's Fisheries. The same as the paving. Booth's Fisheries was trucking fish out of Petit de Gras, so they needed decent roads to, to take the fish out. And that was the, the reason initially for the, uh, the roads to be paved. And the first road paved on Isle Madame was the road from the bridge to the fish plant. It brought about uh, an improvement in infrastructure. It, bought, it brought about an improvement in people's earning power because now they were making a steady wage so they could invest in things like cars and homes, improvements to their homes, uh, consumer goods, uh, TVs, fridges. Uh, you have to remember that even right through the 1950s to the early 1960s, a lot of people on Almadam didn't have indoor plumbing or toilets or uh, they would have had electricity in the house, but the electricity would have been used for lights. It wouldn't have been used for, for things like uh, consumer appliances. The fish plant was pumping over $10 million in payroll into the local economy. And that allowed, that in turn allowed, uh, that stability that that brought allowed an expansion of government infrastructure such as schools and hospitals. And that in turn provided more jobs, stable uh, jobs in the community. The 1960s offered a change for Almadam as increased government spending led to a mini industrial boom in Petit de Gras in addition to the money put into the community by the plant alone. This dominance was challenged early in the 1970s by two unfortunate events. The Aero oil spill, which depleted groundfish stocks along Almadam South Coast, and the prolonged strike at Boots Fisheries, which forever changed the cozy relationship between plant and community. Then the unimaginable happened as it appeared that the fish stocks were decreasing. Trawlerman Emide Boudreau noticed a disturbing trend. Uh, the biggest change I found was the fish moved into deeper waters. I don't know, because of the change in the climate, the environment, but uh, where we used to fish uh, like in 75 fathom of water, but in the last two or three years we were fishing, we had to move into 150 to 200 fathom. But everybody was worried about what we're going to do next, what we're going to live on. And most of the people I talked to didn't believe it could happen, didn't believe it was going to happen. Former DFO area manager Ralph Britton took note of another disheartening scene while inspecting the catches of Almadam fishermen. Generally speaking, the fish was getting smaller, particularly cod. And uh, trips were smaller. But the, uh, I've never heard a fisherman admit that. You'll get your reports from the fishermen that the uh, small harbors and uh, bays around Newfoundland are full of cod. But they've gone out and done a survey and found out that's not so. There's some cod, but it's not consistent in every bay. The numbers aren't consistent. Some are down. But the fishermen, of course, they want to go fishing there, you know. That's what they do. They just want to get back to work. It, it, was, a, it was a progressive thing o over a number of years. See, I was in the uh, inspection originally, and uh, we did a lot, a lot of inspections on board the boats. And you could see that the, the fish were getting smaller almost every year. You could detect it, you know, the, the percentage of large uh, medium and small was changing. 
what were there more uh, more small fish, and the, the crews were still uh, culling outside. So, uh, you know, it was. This is not a scientific uh, conclusion, but you ha I had to conclude in my own mind that something was happening out there. The fish were just getting smaller. This decline in fish landings and in mature fish crippled Almadam's historical ground fishery and by the 1980s had spread to the then Richmond fisheries and Petit de Gras. I would say by the mid 1980s, late 1980s for sure, the fish plant stopped hiring people. They weren't, they were still operating, but they weren't take, there wasn't a new generation moving from from uh, late high school years into the fish plant anymore because they just weren't hiring. When I was in high school, a few of my classmates went to work at the fish plant and they were laid off after a year or two. And they were the last generation of young people to make the transition into the fish plant and they didn't stay there very long. So that was a, a sign of what was, what lay ahead. And over the course of maybe four or five years, you could see the number of, of independent boats, boats not tied to the fish plant, but inshore fishermen who were selling their licenses, selling their boats, and getting out of the fishery. And that occurred from the uh, mid to late 1980s to right up to the mid 1990s. So what a 10 year period. I mean, it didn't, the decline didn't happen overnight. They didn't shut the fish plant down one day and say, that's it, we're not opening it again. First they shut it down for six months, and then they'd open it for nine months, and then it would be shut down for nine months. And um, Of course, all of that decline was based on the fact that the company wasn't able to, uh, didn't have a quota for fish, and the fishermen weren't able to catch any fish. There was just no fish left in the ocean. It was dying even in the last 15 years at Richmond Fisheries, and many workers that were there I would tell you if it hadn't been for the unemployment insurance as, a, as an income supplement, they would have probably starved with the amount of work that they were getting at the plant. As the 1990s arrived, the sad trends served as unwanted writing on the wall for workers at the Richmond Fisheries Plant in Petit de Gras, like union leader Alvin Martel and former worker Billy Sampson. Well, in 1990, uh, the, uh, the landings that the boats brought into the fish plant were kept getting smaller and smaller, and then it got to a point that uh, in 1992 it was really impossible for the, uh, or not even viable for the company to send the boats out fishing. Well, you've seen a difference in the, the amount of fish being caught, first of all. You know, like you had uh, boats that used to go out, and in two days they'd load up with, you know, 240, 300,000 pounds of fish. And, you know, in the early 80s, uh, late 70s, and then they started declining to the point where they'd get, uh, you know, 175, and they'd be out for 10 and 12 days. That's the biggest difference I found, you know, like the, the catch just dropped way down. You could tell the fish was getting smaller and smaller and smaller every year, you know. Instead of catching all this big steak cod, they were coming in with, uh, well, medium markets, you know, and even smaller scrod cod, and you could tell that, you know, all the big stuff was going away, well, that's the, biggest, that's the biggest difference I found in it, you know. Others directly and indirectly involved in the fishery recognized a major problem looming in Almadam's main industry. John Boudreau had been working with and on behalf of Almadam fishery groups for years. Oh, the, well, the, the basic change obviously has been the demise of every ground fish species on the Scotian shelf. Um, uh, started basically with haddock, uh, went through pollock and then codfish. Flounder species are still somewhat available but not enough to be commercially viable. And uh, basically uh, the redfish was the last to go. So species by species, uh, uh, we attacked the fisheries and with the domino effect that we knocked one over and proceeded to the next one. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it, uh, over a period of, uh, a very short period as a matter of fact, of about seven years, we took, uh, we took uh, every species and, and brought them near the brink of extinction. <laughs> 
I guess there would be two two areas of, of thought when you were speaking with local fishermen. One of the one of the uh, areas would have been people saying that uh, uh, the fish were moving, that actually fish stocks were not declining, that there were still ample fish stocks in the ocean, but that the fish were in different areas, and we had to uh, uh, create a, a new capacity to go after them where they were. Uh, and the other, of course, the other fishermen, the more realistic ones, were saying, "No, we realize what." been happening we've been uh, we've been uh, battering the stocks and they're just not there anymore uh, so the you had a number of people who recognized the dilemma that they were in uh, not that it prepared them any better to deal with it they were still at the same point as everybody else that their livelihood was uh, evaporating before their eyes and uh, basically they didn't know where to turn Karen Malcolm lobster fish with her husband for years but the downturn in stocks was not just restricted to cod. Well, um, my experience, because I have come from the fisheries, I and my husband had lobster fished. Um, I had my ear to what the fishermen were saying at the time. Uh, we were lobster fishing and the catches were going down. We also had scallop license. Um, people were not using their scallop license anymore because there really wasn't anything to catch. And just listening to what else was happening within the fisheries, there was a a lot of pessimism about, um, you know, is there going to be any fish next year? And people were getting quite worried.